I'm Larry Ponto Brown, and this is Black Art Today. Welcome to Black Art Today's video series, Uncovered. Uncovered is Black Art Today's intimate conversations with artists of African descent that represent African culture in the genres of literature, visual arts, and the performing arts. In today's episode, Black Art Today interviews Baltimore's native son and renowned artist, Larry Poncho Brown. I was introduced to art kind of uh, in a generational way. My, I'm a second generation art. My dad was a teenage parent and had me. So I watched him around the house just, and he was self-taught, trying to learn and paint. And so that was pretty much my early introduction. Uh, by the time I got to grade school, a couple of my teachers recognized my talent. So from that point, I decided to, well, it was my friend. It was my childhood friend. So that's what I did with all my personal time. You're talking about, you know, the early 70s. Um, there were no TVs, not that many TVs. I came from a pretty poor family. So um, art kept me off the streets. Art kind of saved my life quite a few times. But my interest came very, very early. And then by me deciding to follow my father's footsteps, even with regard to education, I went to Carver Vocational Technical High School which was a trade school at that point in Baltimore um, history timeline. Most people that were in a trade learned from vocational schools. We had Mergenthal and we had Carver. Uh, and so they had a legacy of creating entrepreneurs. And so um, that was pretty much my introduction into art. my 39th year as a professional artist so I mean I can remember um, when this market first opened up in the, in the mid 80s to where it is now so I can't say that one show stands out any more than the others I think what happens for me is that I can uh, through that timeline remember certain times in history where the economy was a particular way uh, in my instance I came through at a particular time in history uh, during the golden age of African American artists, they make phrase to uh, between 1985 and say to uh, 95. So that was a different time. It was uh, people were were starving for culture. Uh, it was kind of the Black Panther factor that we see now, but it was in the arts. Um, so I see some shows now that are a derivative of what used to be, namely the Harlem Fine Arts Show. Um, they're a good example of a show that's uh, really modeled after the shows of that era, but are suffering from um, some of the things that are um, pretty prevalent to deal with now as far as technology, um, mega shows, I think, are, are, so that, that, I think that period pretty much has passed. Um, so I can't say that one stands out more than the other. Um, I will say that this is a time where uh, any type of creative event would be successful because people are looking for something different. Uh, Charles is like um, one of the few artists that I bonded with almost immediately. Um, our sensibilities are so similar, our language is so similar, our drawing styles are very similar, the way we think is similar. So uh, we were sitting around a pool one day at this place contemplating the last time we had a block of time to create work and we all we went back to college time when you didn't have responsibilities, kids XYZ. And so we said, man, I wonder what would it be like if we could get together and just lock ourselves in and create artwork for a month. And so we laughed and thought about it. And I said, well, you know, if we did it, we would have to do it in the August, which is the deadest month for artists, or January. And so we both narrowed it down to January. 
Um, and we had a couple of different challenges to making it actually happen, but the first one happened at his house because the other artists we invited all had schedules. Um, it was a it's a wonderful experience because you get to see creativity at its best. Um, we have continued doing those. We started in 2006. Uh, we did four of them. One was in Los Angeles, one was in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're going to continue to do them in different locations. It's just a matter of trying to find artists that are available for three straight weeks because the premise is you work for three straight weeks around the clock, you do a show the last week. And uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, we did one in, in LA with four artists, uh, Deborah Shedrick, uh, Gwen Redfern, Charles Bibbs, and myself. We created over 120 pieces in three weeks of concentrated time. And in that particular situation, we, um, we were in a gallery that had a loft upstairs. So we made the loft, divided it up, and made it into uh, living stations. And we literally were painting around the clock. Somebody was in the studio uh, around the clock. And so I, I, I encourage artists, number one, to work close together. And number two, to uh, do these residencies where you get a chance to work with each other. So it's a wonderful experience to uh, undertake something like that. But it's a challenge too, because we usually have artists coming from four different directions, the personalities, the idiosyncrasies, the different ways of working. Uh, it's a pure education. One of the most um, sacred things artists can do is work together. And like musicians who are seamlessly able to work with each other, regardless of your personality, your style, and whatever, I do believe that artists are able to do that when given the opportunity. And in the African-American art realm, it's very prevalent. So a lot of us have been doing pieces together. It's like a thing now. Before it wasn't a thing. And I, I'm responsible for one of the first three artist collaborations that was published. And that was for, uh, Leroy Campbell, LaShawn Beale, and myself. And that whole concept actually started in a, we were in a restaurant, in uh, a Senegalese restaurant in Brooklyn, New York, with a paper cover table. And we were scribbling on the table. And we started talking about these projects we wanted to do. And that was one of the things we talked about, was doing a multi-artist collaboration. At that point, Charles Bibbs was supposed to be one of the three, but we ended up moving LaShawn Beale in his place because he had uh, a busy schedule. So I say that to say that artists are very scripted. They do what's, what's popular, what people want. Uh, it can be a, a real watered down thing when you start creating artwork for a particular market. Uh, technically, it's another challenge too because artists have a whole lot of different perspectives. Some are self-taught, some are trained, some are from graphics, some are from the fine art side. So when you collaborate, it's actually, you're looking at somebody else's work and trying to figure out how you can collaborate with that, how you want to add something to this where it's a balance. And it's not as easy as it sounds. For instance, I received one from Cynthia St. James in 1996 and I'm still not finished <laughs> because I got this thing it's square, it's primary colors, and it's like it just intimidated me to the point where I really didn't know what to do on it. Then I started working on it, and when I started working on it, I didn't like what I did. But here it is now, 2018, and I know how to finish it now. So I've had some that have done, me and Charles probably have done upwards of 20 collaborations, maybe two major ones that were published. But we did a whole slew of small originals because for a while we were doing shows where we would do small originals and we saw them directly as we would make them. Um, I've done some with Sean B. I I have uh, one in my drawing uh, table now with uh, uh, Kenneth Gatewood. He's fussing at me because that was probably about eight years old now. Um, Karen Buss just fussing at me. I have one that's been sitting. We're at like the 98% point and I still haven't finished it. So it, you have to juggle it with your schedule. You have to juggle it with your creativity. People think that artists paint 24 hours a day. I don't paint 24 hours a day. I paint four months out of the year. And so if it doesn't come during that four months, it's going to wait till the next cycle comes. The other points of the year, I'm doing administrative stuff. So collaborations are important because it gives us a chance to really just get off the, the treadmill and to use raw creativity.
I would have to say hands down music. Music kind of sets a stage for me uh, because artists are time travelers. I mean, we're the kind of people we can come into a room at nine o'clock, take out a blank sheet or whatever, start working, and then 12 hours later, we don't realize how much time we've invested. And so to try to do that in a space that's quiet, I think would may have me jumping out of a window. Whereas listening to music becomes a, a, a real spiritual kind of a connection. It helps me drift away, more or less. So hands down, it would be music. And there are times when I have to really, if I'm doing research stuff, I'll turn the music off because I need to focus. But when I'm painting, it's probably the space where my brain is disconnected, it's pulled out the wall, and I'm just, just doing what I do. And music probably would be hands down uh, the one thing I have to have. I could not do without it in my studio space. Wow. Uh, in the heyday of the Golden Age of African American Art, we were servicing upwards of 3,000 galleries nationwide that were dealing with uh, specializing in African American art. And so I've literally done shows in over a hundred, at least 150 of those galleries. Um, and again, after that quantity of shows, they kind of blend together. Um, it's, it's a difficult question. I can't say what was the weirdest thing that ever happened. I can say that notoriety was something that I really, and most artists really don't understand. And so there was a point where my notoriety began to exceed my interpretation of it. And uh, I think those were the weirder times when I had to adjust to the amount of people that knew of me in a strange state that um, it took me a while to really adjust to that so I would say that hands down would be the thing that was the weirdest is that when your popularity exceeds what you think it is and you go into a town and you think this is going to be another show and these people know more about you than people know about it you at home wow pet peeves there are two statements that have always thrown me. Now, one is, I know all artists hear this, and that's when folks don't know what to say. So they say, I really like your colors. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> okay. The other thing is a pet peeve. Um, these are things that people can come and say to me, and depending on what my state of mind is, I am either defensive or I may say something sarcastic or take me out of the normal calm personality that I have. The biggest pet peeve I have is when somebody walk up to me and say, hey, that's new for you. What does that mean? You're an authority on Larry Poncho Brown now, right? I know I should not, but every artist has a statement or two that just takes them there. Those are my two. I deal with them maturely, but they still make my eyes roll up in my head. Pet peeves as far as the art industry is concerned is that um, I just think that people have a lack of, of real sophistication when it comes to culture. Um, they will go in Macy's and spend $500 like it's nothing, but then come to an artist's booth, see something they like, and then they'll, they'll try to nickel and dime you to what they want to pay. And they would not do that anywhere else. They would have the luxury of doing it anywhere else, but um, you know, artists spend a lot of time to do what they do. That would be a pet peeve. That doesn't bother me as much because I understand it. Um, but yeah, on the wrong day, get the hell out of my booth. It's like you really have under, or, or that person, oh, I got one that just popped into my head. You go through a three day, two day show, you get to the end of the show. Somebody's been lurking like a stalker and they come into your booth while you're breaking down and they say, hey, you." You know, I guess you're ready to get rid of it now. Or you have that piece. Man, get the hell out of here. Matter of fact, you help me pack my shit and put it in the car. That's a pet peeve.
I, I those are one of the ones you just want to take the stack of business cards and just throw them at his face and hope he gets a paper cut. Cause it's like, where are you coming from with that? You know? I mean, I thought I've heard some crazy stuff for people that look at your shit and want to take it home. Because I think it really talks to what kind of people we are. And people's personalities. Uh, art is no different. You want to see a personality? Let a person start looking at something they want and then how they interact with you to get it. Just like the quarantine, um, Artists have always fantasized about going to Africa together as a group. And so I got tired of, you know, one thing I love about my brother Charles Bibbs is that when I talk to other artists and we theorize about things we want to do, um, Ted Ellis, <laughs> I call him Ted Talks, because we've talked about all these things and then they never happen. Uh, but Charles is the one guy that if you say something like that to him, it's going to happen. And so I, I picked up that drive when it comes to initiating my visions and my projects and my, um, the different types of projects I get involved in. So I said, well, let me put together a trip called Travel Agent. Um, Harold, the late Harold Cook um, was right here in Silver Spring, Maryland. They had been doing, uh, Henderson Travel had been doing trips to Africa since the 1950s. And um, he took me on a, a tour, we call it Artists to Africa. Uh, we took a group to uh, Ghana the first year, and then um, maybe two years after that we went to Senegal. Uh, we lost Harold, so that derailed me doing those trips for a while, uh, but we'll be doing that again. I think that uh, people used to always come and say, Pancho, man, I've been to Africa, and we did this, and we did that. Man, that was a spiritual situation, and yeah, you just got to go. And I was like, they're just ragging me because they went someplace on a vacation, and they, you know. So... Uh, when I got to my first trip in Africa, I took my son with me. He was 12 years old. And my mother had just passed. And I can't tell you how magical that trip was. It was uh, redefining for me and my son. Uh, he, um, was, uh, he was having trouble in school, but when he came back, he really got his life together. He picked new friends. He had a different seriousness about um, his work ethic. Um, so I noted that if it happened to my son at 12, that I can only imagine what would happen to artists if I took them on a trip and not just did the touristy stuff, but took them where they did the carvings, where they did the metal work, where they did the X, Y, and Z. And uh, we hope to do more of them on a larger scale. The most we've done, we've done artists and art collectors. And so we've had groups of around 10. Um, but I want to do one where we have like 60. Whenever an artist is in an environment, they are like sponges. They pick up all kinds of imagery, colors, movement. The brain just does some stuff. And you don't know how it's going to manifest it, but it will eventually manifest it. And if you look on a lot of my pieces, I have about three in particular that were done right after I got back from Africa that had a, a flavor of what I uh, experienced when I was there. So yes, it does affect your work, and that's why I encourage all artists to take that trip. Artists get all uh, caught up in originality and what they think is theirs. But then you go to a place like Africa and you see stuff you've been doing, and you realize there's a genetic thing that happens to us. There is a DNA strand in us somewhere that has recorded all of that stuff. And so I, I, I encourage all artists to go and, and reconnect to your origin, and it will definitely affect your work. Well, presently, I'm 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 um, I'm in a different mindset now. Before, I relied on my shows and my schedule to make my living. And uh, the last two years, I have been trying my best to do things closer to home and not be on the road, and to take the time and and put more proposals together, present more things to people. Um, I, I tend to get better projects that way. 
and people that know of my work, it's easier for me to sell my, my ideas to people like that. So um, rather than me going to a show and spending $1,000 for a booth and setting up and sitting there for two days and I'm competing against 40 other vendors, I would rather write a proposal to the American Cancer Society because I've donated work to them every year and do a special project together for next year. That's where my head is. And so I really believe that Despite all the things that's happening in the art world today, there are so many things available for artists, but we have to create our, our, um, our projects. We have to create our opportunities because waiting by the phone or waiting for an email to drop in your box to tell you what show is coming, that day is over. Currently, I'm working on collaboration piece with Charles Bibbs. We're both being featured at the Ethnic Art Gallery in Kansas City, Missouri in October so we're trying to create one or two collaboration pieces before that show in October and so those are the immediate things that's on the table but I'm always sitting down developing proposals for ideas for future projects that was another artist dinner we used to do that after shows, these group shows like Philadelphia Art Expo and uh, we had the Puff Building show in New York and when we got done and wrapped up the day we would go to a restaurant and take over a table and we would just talk, you know, BS like a card game or we would talk about ideas and that was one of the things where I think I was at a table with a bunch of artists and I said something to the effect of, I want to do some ponchos with poncho written on it. And everybody laughed and I'd laugh with them. I said, this must be a, it must have sounded like a whack idea. And then uh, I found a dealer that did tapestries. And I was like, man, I could do a poncho out of a tapestry. And so I'm the one laughing now. You know, I think you, sometimes you get these visions and you have to follow your visions. Uh, I've always wanted to do a clothing line, but I also didn't like the t-shirt market. I didn't like, uh, I, I said, well, okay, poncho is like a, a branding product it's it's timeless if you do a nice set of ponchos other folks will won't won't want to do them because you know you already kind of did it and it worked out that way and so I got into the clothing line and I got into it reluctantly because I was intimidated by the whole fashion world as a matter of fact when I first put them out they were a meager $75 but when I started doing fashion shows and going to participate in a few of those, I realized the price was just way, way, way too low to even be a fashion item. So we adjusted it based on that because we wanted it to be something that was affordable as well. Um, so uh, I want to extend it, but because the unit cost to produce them is so high, um, I might have to go to China to get them done. <laughs> <laughs> but right now we're using the company down in South Carolina to produce the force. Uh, uh, whenever you do a product, I am the licensing king. I've done calendars, mugs, underwear with my artwork on them. You just have to. Art can be translated into anything, man. We've done coasters, we've done figurines, we've done magnets. I, I mean, we've done tote bags, we've done, what's the wildest thing I think I've ever done? I can't even imagine. We've done dildos. No, I'm just joking. We're working on those now. <laughs> my, my point is, art can be translated into just about anything. An artist got to get off their soapbox and get busy because there's so many opportunities out there. If you see a product and you walk by, you go, man, I wonder what my artwork would look like on that. You better follow up on it because right now we're at a time where all this stuff can be produced. This is the most exciting time to be an artist. Despite all the bullshit that's happening in the world, despite the whole mentality of the world right now with this asshole in the office, there are more opportunities to create your own vision now than ever before because nobody's watching. So while all these folks are over here talking all this negative bullshit and scared, initiate your ideas. That's why another reason why Black Art Today is important because y'all taking advantage of something that's needed and, it's, and you have nobody staring over your shoulder. I say that towards any artist. Now is the time to step it up.
Well, see, that's the misconception is that she really is not a mistress. She's stronger than a mistress. See, women will love me for being an artist and being creative and, you know, he's traveling, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's kind of funny, he's kind of cute. But they don't really, they really underestimate the connection I have with this work. And it's, they find out real quick that this is real. You know, when I devote 14 hours a day to this, like it's nothing, I tell you artists are time travelers. Imagine the effect that would have on anybody who has low self-esteem, somebody who doesn't have a life. You have to, we have to pick our partners wisely. I have been battling that issue with relationships my entire life. Because for the first part of my life, I allow people to tell me what I could and couldn't do and what I shouldn't do and try to meet people's expectations and try to justify who I am as an artist to people. And now I'm at a stage in my life where I live straight up unapologetically for who I am, just like everybody else does. So that does leave a challenge. Most women can't deal with my mistress. But the thing is, they don't realize that mistress is a part of me, it's part of my personality. And so they look at it as an innate thing to, to compete against when it's, you're actually competing against a part of my personality. You'll lose every time. Wow. That's a deep question. The obvious answer is in 1995, I had a studio fire where I lost everything. If you can imagine, I was always a very um, motivated young artist. So I started in the business around 17 and I was just hungry. I was just art 24 seven. I probably was getting two, three hours of sleep and still was just grinding, 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 grinding. Every dime I made, I reinvested to back into the business. And uh, I had built this distribution business from 1985 on up to 1995. And um, I, I had invested, invested, invested. I sucked so much money into the business that I was just getting ready to see uh, the payoff of my investment when this fire hit. And I lost a million and a half worth of stuff with no insurance. Um, it took out everything that I did from age eight to 1995 so I essentially had to start over again in 1995 and that was right in the middle of me really blowing up as an artist that was quite traumatic I mean it, it led me to depression it led, almost led me to suicide um, it was redefining at the same time I got a chance to see what very few artists get a chance to see and that is the impact they've had up to that point Man, I had, I had people mailing me back originals. I had people mailing me back prints. I had artists sending me checks. I had collectors sending me checks. I mean, for that year, I think my, my supporters supported me for that whole year after that. I didn't, I was in such a deep depression that I stayed in the house. I didn't paint for about two years after that. That's how damaging it was. Uh, so that was probably the lowest place I've been. And the second is that I was uh, the one, one of the main people who was responsible for my success was a gentleman by the name of Chanel Alford. He was my high school um, art teacher uh, and my second father. He really, um, without him, I would have been in jail. I had one foot in the street, one foot in school. He was the person that said, hey, I'm going to make sure you stay in school. He was the one that gave me my first job when I was 14 years old. And he passed um, a couple of years after my father passed, which was really hard for me. Um, and then right after he died, I was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, that took me out. I was always health conscious, didn't drink, didn't smoke, and I was diagnosed with cancer. But I think all these things redefine who you are. Um, I speak now actively on depression because artists are very susceptible to depression. Nobody told me that. I, I saw it 
everywhere I went with artists, there was this thing that I could sense and I couldn't put my finger on it. And that was that artists deal with depression more than most people. I started noticing in my, in my musician friends that thing, that undiscussed thing, and it was depression. And so now when I talk to artists and my mentorship with artists, I'm now able to talk to them on a spiritual level that I couldn't before through the losses that I've had to endure. And so I think at some point, our dysfunctional artist family has to really get a chance to know one another, speak and talk about the things that are important. And I'm, I'm noticing my artist friends now beginning to do that for the first time, really speaking on another level on the things that they've gone through and the struggles that we have. Uh, so those are two redefining moments in my life that I really haven't shared with a lot of people. Um, but who knows, somebody might see this and get encouraged. Black Arts Day is important because we're at a time now of multimedia. And, um, when I make reference to the golden age of African American art, the reason why I do that is because that period happened so fast and the money was coming so furiously that nobody thought about documenting that period of time. And so there's a lot of history encapsulated in that period that basically could easily become lost. Um, Black Art Today has the potential of documenting artisans. And I think that when you use multimedia that way, it's an educational element that um, is undisputable. The thing I love about social networking is that um, I came through a time where I didn't know a lot about Baldwin or Nina Simone when I was coming through school, but now you can go online and see documentaries of them. That's powerful to be able to get that kind of history because you know all of our history was uh, controlled. So that's the importance of um, Black Art Today, is that they get a chance to really put people on the pulse of what's happening in the creative community.